About a week ago, prominent Steam Decker Cryobyte33 published to his GitHub page his latest version of his Cryo Utilities 2.0, which includes some improvements for the Steam Deck in terms of memory, operating system behavior, as well as storage improvements. I've recommended his swap updates in the past, but after looking through the subreddit post where it announces the new tool, have I been overlooking the ultimate tool for the Steam Deck? How does it handle How the does newest it games? How do I tell is my this wife? too good to be Will true? Is the Steam Deck Why didn't really I a think console? Of that? Uh, stop! Get out of my head. I've got three words for you guys. Trust, but verify. Let's go. Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a good one. Today, we aim to see if the hype behind Cryo Utilities is well-deserved or over-exaggerated. Cryobyte's video covering his utility is Excellent, I definitely recommend you guys go and watch his video. His explanation of swap, swappiness, trim, and all of the other tech jargon is spot on, and it's worth learning a bit more of what's going on behind the scenes in your Steam Deck. But in the grand scheme of things, and in my own private testing, I've found very little improvement when it comes to my gameplay when I use his recommendations. Many online have claimed that his utility has improved their gaming experience, so on both sides, personal anecdotes can only go so far. With two conflicting stories, let's go find some objective empirical data. Today, I'm going to be covering nearly my entire Steam library, including 27 different games. I've got GPU and CPU limited games, memory sensitive and well optimized games, Unreal Engine, CryEngine, Creation, and many other engines are included, so I'm going to be covering all the bases. Most of these games are AAA, but these are the type of games that would benefit the most from the sort of tweaks that Cryo Utilities aims to assist with. Less than half of the games provide built-in benchmarks such as Returnal, Chernobylite, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Forza Horizon 5. Many games provide on-rail sequences that reflect in-game gameplay and are highly reproducible. These take a bit of in-game know-how to find that right spot for testing, and these include Cyberpunk, Crisis, and Counter-Strike. The next set of games have extremely linear segments early on in the game that work decent enough for this comparison. This includes Sons of the Forest, Hogwarts Legacy, Metro 2033, Control, and Fallout 4. Now, for the rest, I've created a reproducible sequence of navigation and gameplay that is relatively reproducible with high levels of confidence. This includes Valheim, DayZ, No Man's Sky, Apex Legends, Quake Champions, and Path of Exile. As for my deck, I'm going to be running it off of the Stable branch, which utilizes SteamOS 3.4.4 with the 5.13 kernel. It's also packing in the 1.10 firmware version. Now, as for Proton, there's no one single version that's going to work for all of the different games today. So I'm going to be switching between the 7.0-6, Proton Experimental, as well as Proton GE 7-49. Now I can guarantee that each of the games is going to be running the same version of Proton for both sets of data today, so there shouldn't be any cross-contamination across the board. Each game was run three different times, and I'm going to be averaging the average frame rate and 1% lows across the samples. If you do the math, that's over 150 different test passes. This video has taken a lot of time to put together, so hit that red subscribe button down below if you think I've earned your support. With that all out of the way, let's put all of the games on the screen. I want to see if Cryo Utilities satisfies three different criteria to justify the hype. The first criterion is to highlight if a game works or not. As many of you know, a lot can go wrong with the Steam Deck software stack, so I think this is an excellent place to start. In my testing, I have found two games that both work and break with Cryo Utilities. Hot off the presses is Sons of the Forest, a survival game that looks fantastic on the deck. The performance could be better, but as it stands, it fails to open into the main story at the time of my recording with the stock Steam Deck. However, after loading up CryoUtils 2.0's recommended settings, the game loads and I can run sub 30 FPS at low detail settings, so that's a solid win for CryoUtils. Unfortunately, one of the most significant game updates to work on the deck is currently broken with these settings, and that's Halo Infinite. The game is significantly less prevalent than early last year, but this is a giant L for competitive multiplayer shooters with cryo utils. 
My next criteria is what games achieve a solid 10% or more improvement with average frame rates. As you can see from the graphs, if a game gets 10% improvement, that translates between 3 and 6 FPS in most instances, and any lower is far less noticeable. With that, Borderlands 3 manages to go up from an already decent 55 FPS to 61 FPS on average. Quake Champions improves upon its 79 FPS score, hitting nearly 90 FPS. And the ever popular third person action shooter Warframe breaks the 100 FPS barrier just barely, thanks in part to cryo utils. For handheld gaming, average frame rates are really important, but 1% lows dramatically impact how good a game feels. I've found 8 games that achieve a 10% improvement in 1% lows. Again, these improvements aren't revolutionary, but they are noticeable. Cyberpunk 2077 almost hits a solid 30 FPS at the low quality setting. Valheim was challenging to test, but with a clear blue sky running across the coast to an open field, saw a near doubling in 1% lows. GTA 5 was less impressive, but a positive result getting into the lower 20s. Fallout 4 and DayZ follow suit, with a 6 FPS bump in 1% low frame rate. Doom Eternal is an interesting case study of the tool's operation, but I don't have time to dig into that right now but a solid improvement from a sub 30 FPS 1% low to a comfortable 41 is quite significant. Quake Champions again sees improvements along with its average frame rate. And last but not least is Counter-Strike. As blasphemous as playing this game on a controller can be, Cryo Utils does get us that near locked 60 FPS experience for 1% lows. For the last criteria, take a closer look at the graphs. Do y'all notice the purple lines? Those are our frame rate thresholds for suitable gaming. As such, I only saw five games Cryo Utilities helped bump playability to a new threshold. Now, I find this a bit more telling than some of the other criteria. Can you really see the difference in an improved 42 to 48 FPS in average frame rate? Or can you notice a 1% low improvement of 16 to 24 FPS? These thresholds cross typical V-Sync or optimization targets, which is far more critical than just a raw frame rate improvement. Chernobylite crosses the 30 FPS 1% low boundary by the skin of its teeth. Borderlands 3 bumps into the 60 FPS tier by a slim margin, but still a win. DayZ is similar to Chernobylite, but a win is a win. Doom Eternal remains a solid 60 plus FPS experience. Still, with cryo utils, you can guarantee fewer dips in frame rate, which is ideal with dynamic resolution scaling. Last is Counter Strike. Again, hitting the coveted 60 FPS shooter experience with a controller. So, I agree with Cryobyte's premise that his tool does improve performance in some instances, but is what we're seeing today the ultimate tool? Or is the performance we're measuring actually that massive? I'm not that convinced, so let's dive a little deeper. One thing I've tried to help clarify with this channel is differentiating the marketing hype from what is actually available. Many times, it's easy to be led to a particular selling point when the reality isn't as rosy. Let's start with average frame rate improvement with cryo utilities. Let's highlight the games from earlier in the video. And for completeness, let's also include the games that have a 5% improvement. Taking all games into account, Cryo Utils only improves performance by a decent amount in one in every four games tested. Beyond that, performance in the 3% range is less than ideal. By most benchmarking and reviewer standards, that result turns out to be a wash. Now let's take it down another level and look at the raw performance improvement. This is where the rubber meets the road, and in the grand scheme of things, only four games see noticeable improvement. And unfortunately, those games are already at levels where the improvements are still relatively insignificant to the overall experience. This is where the massive performance claims fall on their face, and that has to be acknowledged. Let's shift gears to the 1% lows. Cryo Utils has several more games that improve in this regard, but is the improvement all that significant? 
Clearly, Valheim, Cyberpunk, Quake, and Doom easily get a solid checkmark, with CSGO, DayZ, Grand Theft Auto V, and Fallout 4 coming in just a little bit behind. But Portal 2, Warframe, Path of Exile, and Control, they just break that 5% threshold with modest improvements. Shifting over to the raw 1% low improvements, only four of them manage double-digit improvements. That is a massive improvement, but can you tell the difference between these single-digit gains? Cyberpunk definitely is a solid win, but can you notice that in Grand Theft Auto V? How about DayZ, or Fallout, or even Warframe? Those gains are far less detectable than in other games. On average, CryoUtils only sees a 10% improvement in 1% lows across the games tested today. For those of you that skipped ahead and don't like looking at charts, here's my 30 second summary for CryoUtils. Out of the 27 games I've tested, only 11% of games improve the average frame rate by a noticeable amount. Only 1 in 4 games see marginal improvement above the margin of error. Only 30% of games improve their 1% low frame rates by a noticeable amount. Less than half of the games tested see marginal improvements beyond measurement error. And though Cryo Utils fixes Sons of the Forest, it unfortunately crashes Halo Infinite in all of my test passes. From an objective standpoint, Cryo Utilities is a net benefit for running on the Steam Deck. Still, it's far from a definitive recommendation for improving performance for your Steam Deck. I commend Cryobyte 33 for developing his tool, but judging by the data presented in this video, I think that the hype that comes along with it is a bit over the top, and I think it actually oversells the capability of the tool. Now don't take this the wrong way, I don't think the tool was made in vain. I really think that Cryo Utilities highlights some significant issues with SteamOS 3, and with this data, I think it can all go towards improving the environment in future releases. A larger swap space is generally a good idea, but setting swappiness to 1 might not be ideal, especially in games with colossal memory implications. Adding trim to maintain and support your internal storage device is always a good idea. So I'm going to continue working behind the scenes to see how Cryo Utilities can be tweaked and improved to see if we can come up with a better recommendation as to a global recommended setting for his utility. As for the data, I've already showed it to Plagman, and I hope that he and Lawrence will be able to look at it and do a little bit more research to see if these types of improvements should be integrated into SteamOS 3.5. And that's all I have to say about Cryo Utilities 2.0. Again, special shout out to Cryobyte33. I love his videos. He does an excellent job of explaining some of the lower level technologies built into Linux and how that impacts our Steam Deck performance. So I've got a link to his video as well as his channel. So make sure you guys subscribe to him and show him some more support. But again, thank you guys for sticking to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll catch you guys in the next one.